In this video, we're going to take a look at linear search. So there's a lot of different search algorithms out there, but linear search is probably the easiest to go about understanding and implementing, and it's a good place for us to start. If we think about searching in general, uh, it's probably one of the most important and useful things that a computer can help us do. So if you think about how you use a computer on a daily basis, you're probably doing a lot of searching. So you may go out on the web and, and search for music or search for a movie. Uh, locally, you may search for a particular document on your machine. So the searching really is going on a lot on, a, on probably a daily basis in terms of how you use a computer. So linear search, while it's probably not employed you know, by any search engine or probably even by you know, searching for a document on your computer, it is a, an important algorithm for us to understand. So this is the way linear search works. So let's take a look at this array that we have here. And it's a very small array. It's just a five element. And we'll say that it's an int array since it has all int values stored in each element. And what would happen is, is we would have some particular value we were searching for. So let's say that we were searching for uh, 16. What would happen is we would start at the very beginning of this array, so the element that has the index value of 0, and we would compare, is 16 equal to 10? And we would find out that that's not the case, and then, then go to the next element. So sometimes linear search is called sequential search, since it just sequentially moves through each individual element in our array, until finally we get to the thing that we're looking for. So the thing that we were looking for was 16, and we find this in the fourth element of our five-element array, and at that point in time, we can stop our search, since we found the thing that we were looking for. Now, that's not exciting necessarily to just find int values, but it could really be applied to anything that we were looking for. In the worst case scenario with uh, linear search is that we would have to search through the whole entire list. Now, in our case, the whole entire list would just be one more element. So if we were looking for the value 8, we would only have to do one more comparison to find 8 over finding the value of 16. But what if we had a 50,000 element array or 100,000 or a million element array? So that's a lot of comparisons that we'd have to do. Now, one of the cool things about linear search, or maybe the positive approach for linear search, is it doesn't have any preconditions. So there are search algorithms that do have certain preconditions, meaning certain requirements, before they can actually perform uh, what they're supposed to do. So, so take, for instance, a binary search algorithm. It, it requires the list or the array to be sorted. So we couldn't perform that particular algorithm on this list here. But uh, that's not the case with linear search. Linear search says we don't really care. We don't have any preconditions. So the things to keep in mind related to linear search, just to kind of recap, is that it compares uh, each element in sequence. So it keeps comparing until it finds the thing that we're looking for. Uh, it may be the case that the thing that we're looking for is not in the array. So in that case, we would have to traverse through and compare uh, to every single element in the array before we find that out. It doesn't have any preconditions, and in the worst case, as I said, it just searches through the whole entire array, which could be quite bad. So the uh, number of comparisons, the amount of work that's having to be done grows proportionally, at least in the worst case, it grows proportionally to the size of the array that we have. Of course, we can also always get lucky and, and find the thing that we're looking for in the very first element of the array. So if we were searching for the value of 10, we would just simply search or uh, perform a comparison on the first element, and we'd be able to stop. So let's go over to Eclipse and code up our own version of linear search. All right, so I've loaded up Eclipse. I've already created a project and also a CPP file called linear search. And I've typed in uh, the common things that we have within the file. So pound include IO stream using namespace standard. And then I've also written a stub here for our main function. So what we want to be able to do is just create an int array and ask the user to input a particular value that they want to search for. And then we'll search our array using linear search to see if that value exists or not, and then indicate to the user somehow or another if we found the value or we didn't find the value, and maybe where we found it in the array. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is just create an array. So we'll do int, and we'll just call our array a, and we'll make use of uh, the creation and initialization shortcut. So we'll just do uh, int a, open square bracket, close square bracket, and then the assignment operator, and then do open brace and specify the values that we want to have in our array. So we'll say we have the values of 15, uh, 23, 7, 45, uh, maybe 87, and 16. So it looks like we have a, a six-element array here. So we have that, and the next thing we need to do is just get input from the user. So we're going to get some particular int from the user to, to search for. So we'll declare a variable and maybe call it uh, user value, which will hold what the user inputs. So then we'll do uh, cout, and then the insertion operator, and then just say uh, enter an integer, and maybe a colon space, and then another insertion operator, indel. So we'll have that displayed to the user, and then we'll do a cn extraction operator and then user value. 
So just getting uh, some stuff there from the user. Uh, I think before we write the function call for our linear search, we'll actually write the function definition. And I'm going to write it above the main function here just so it can serve as the prototype as well. So if we think about this linear search, you're probably thinking, well, we need to pass in the array to this function. We need to pass in the size. And we also need to pass in the thing that we're searching for. So that's really the search parameters. But, but what about what, what do we return from this function? So the, the thing that we should return is probably something that indicates where we found the value, if we actually found the value in our array, or a value to indicate that we didn't find it. Um, so if we were thinking about where we found it, we would probably return an index value, which would be an int. If we think about maybe something that we could return, if we didn't find it, that could also be an int. It would just have to be an int that's not a valid index. And really, the first invalid index that you could probably think of is, is a negative value. So negative 1 would probably be a good value to return if we don't find the thing in our array. So the return type is just going to be an int. And then the name of our function will just be uh, linear search. So let's see, linear search. And then we need to pass in some values. So the, the formal parameter list is going to just be an int array. So this is, should be fairly familiar to us from some of the other videos. And we also need to pass in the size, so we'll do n size. And then we have another key piece of information that has to be passed in. We've got to pass in what we're searching for. Uh, so we'll say that that's also going to be an int, since we're dealing with int arrays. And we'll say that uh, the uh, formal parameter is just going to be called search value. So really what's going to happen is, is whenever we call linear search, we'll pass in a, we'll pass in size 6, and we'll also pass in user value which will just be known as uh, search value here. So at least we're going to be passing in a copy of that value to search value. All right, so let's go ahead and write the body. So uh, do an open brace, close brace. So if you think about linear search, you need to be visiting each individual element of that array and doing a comparison. So in order to visit each individual element of array, you need to think about that for loop that we've seen before. So we'll say for int i, assignment statement 0, so starting our index value off at 0, and then we'll say as long as i is less than size, semicolon, i++, plus plus, so we've got to make sure we're incrementing our loop counter there, which is also serving as our index. And now, inside the body of that for loop, we've got to focus on what do we need to do on each iteration. Well, on each iteration, we're going to be sitting at a new element, and we can compare that element's value to the search value. So we can just compare the search value to see if that's equal to the uh, particular element that we're now looking at, which would be specified by the name of our array, which is called array, or array is an alias for our array A down here. So we have array, open square bracket I, close square bracket, and what we want to do is just see if, so we're going to write a condition here, see if this particular condition is true, and if that condition is true, we can just simply return the index, which the index value is just I. Now we have to worry about, well, what happens if we exhaust the whole entire array and we still haven't found the value? So at some point in time, i is not going to be less than size and we'll drop out of this for loop. And in that case, that's where we'll return that negative 1. So we'll say return negative 1. So we need to have some indication that we didn't actually find the thing that we were looking for. We didn't find that search value. So that's really it with linear search. You know, what we're doing is just traversing through the array comparing each individual element's value by doing array open square bracket i close square bracket, comparing that to our search value. If those are equal, then we just return the location of where we found that thing. Uh, if we go through the whole thing, we just return uh, negative 1, indicating we didn't find it. So let's go back down to our, our main function here and finish it off. So what we're going to do is just simply call our linear search. So call linear search and pass in a, pass in 6, which is the size, and also pass in user value. So all three of those things need to be passed into our function called linear search. And we know that linear search actually returns a value to us, uh, returns some sort of int. So we'll have a variable over here maybe to uh, capture that return value. So it'll just be an int variable and we'll call it maybe just result. So we'll say result assignment statement and uh, let's not forget our semicolon over here. So uh, that's pretty much it in terms of the function call and now what we need to do is process that result that's returned to us. So what we're going to do is just test to see if uh, that result is, you know, a, a non-negative number. So if it's a non-negative number, we know we found the thing that we were looking for. If it is a negative number, negative 1, uh, we know we didn't find it. So we'll just do a test to see if uh, result is greater than or equal to 0. And if that's the case, we'll do something. Otherwise, else we'll do something else. So let me write the uh, else part here. We'll say else, open brace, 
And maybe the else part is the easier part to do. So we'll do C out, insertion operator, and then say the uh, number, and then whatever number it was that we were looking for. So that's held by the variable uh, user value. And then the insertion operator, and then we'll say uh, was not found. And that's pretty much it for the else part if we happen to uh, not actually find the value that we're looking for. The uh, if part is not really complicated. It's just going to be C out. And then we just want to indicate to the user that we found the particular value and maybe the location, the index value of where we found it. So we'll say the, the number. And we have a couple options here. We could say user value or we could say A open square bracket uh, result since that's the actual index of where we found that thing. Oops, I forgot the uh, insertion operator. So insertion operator A open square bracket result close square bracket and then insertion operator and then we can say uh, was, was found. So the number whatever the number is, was found at the element, we'll say the element um, with index, and then we'll just specify the, the index, which is held by result, and then we'll do insertion operator indel. And that's basically it. Of course, this line is probably a little bit long, so maybe I'll uh, split this up over two lines. So let's go ahead and save that, and uh, let me scroll down just so you can see that. So if the result was greater than or equal to zero, we'll just inform the user uh, that the number, whatever their number was, was found at the element with index and then specify the index that's being held in result. Otherwise else, we'll just say that the number, whatever the number was, was not found. And uh, if we've saved this, let's all go ahead and build it, make sure it builds okay. So it looks like everything's building okay, and now we'll run it. So it says down here on the console to enter in an integer, and let's enter in an integer that actually exists. So let's uh, say 87, since that exists in the array. And it says the uh, number 87 was found at the element with index 4. So does that make sense? So this is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So yeah, it returned the correct index value. So uh, let's run it one more time and see what happens if we put in a value that's not in our array. So we'll put in the value of 25. And we see that the number 25 was not found. So that's pretty much it for this video. Uh, hopefully you've learned about the linear search algorithm and how it works. And also understand that it doesn't have any sort of preconditions, so it doesn't require our array to be sorted like some of the other search algorithms that we'll look at. Uh, but we do know that it doesn't work so well whenever we have to maybe search a very large array. So if we had a 50,000 element array, a 100,000 element array, it's going to take a while to do a comparison sequentially through that. So if our, the value that we're looking for is toward the end of the array or maybe not even in the array, then the linear search really is uh, painful in, in, in terms of the amount of work it's going to have to do in comparison to some of the other search algorithms. In this video, we're going to take a look at the binary search algorithm. So in one of my previous videos, we looked at the linear search algorithm and saw how it worked and also coded up uh, an implementation of it in C++. So with linear search, we didn't have any sort of preconditions. We didn't have to have a sorted array. In the case of binary search, we do have to have a sorted array. So we do have that requirement. But the cool thing about binary search in comparison to linear search is we cut our search space in half on every single comparison. With linear search, if we had a 50,000 or 100,000 element array or maybe a million element array, we may have to do 50,000, 100,000, a million comparisons before we find the value that we're looking for because it may be at the very end of our array or it may not even be at the, in the array at all and, and we, we've done all those comparisons before we find that out. Uh, that's not the case with binary search. So with binary search, with a 50,000 element array, after the first comparison, if the thing that we were looking for uh, didn't match on that first comparison, then it would eliminate half of the search space. So to give you a broad idea of what's going on with the binary search algorithm is that we find a midpoint value. So we're able to calculate that fairly easily since we're dealing with a sorted array. And we will do a comparison between the value that we're searching for and that midpoint value and see if they're the same. If they're not the same, what happens is that we're able to eliminate half of the search space at that point in time, either the bottom half or the top half, depending on if the value that we're looking for is greater than or less than the midpoint value. So let me show you how binary search works on this small array that we have here. So you can see that we have an eight element array here and it meets the precondition of being a sorted array. So all our values here are sorted in ascending order. And we'll say that we're searching for the value of 82. So I'll just 
say SV for search value, and the search value is going to be 82. And we can see the 82 exists in this array. It exists here at the second to the last element of our array. And the way the binary search works is it starts off by setting up a low and high value. The low is just going to be set up to hold the index of the very first element of our array. That's how it uh, starts off. And the high would just be holding the very last index of our array. And then based off of low and high, we calculate a midpoint. So we just simply take the index value at high, add it to low, so this would be 7 plus 0, divide that by 2, which would be 3.5, and then truncate the fractional part since we don't have any uh, fractional index values. So that would be 3. So our midpoint would be set here to 3. And now we do a comparison between this value here at the midpoint, which is 47, and our search value. And we see that those are not equal. And the next thing we do is check to see if our search value is greater than or less than the midpoint value. So if it turns out that the search value is in fact greater than our midpoint value, we're able to update our low value. And the low value would be updated to being one more than the midpoint. And then we would update our midpoint. Now if it turns out that the high value, just to kind of discuss what happens, we know that uh, in our case the search value is in fact greater than the midpoint value. But if it was the case that, uh, say, we were looking for uh, 22 instead of 82, so in that case, we would find that the midpoint or the search value is, in fact, less than the midpoint, and we would end up up updating high to being one less than the midpoint. Let's go ahead and uh, update our low value to being one more than the midpoint. So I'll go ahead and uh, indicate that the L, our low value, is going to be updated to being one more than the midpoint value. And then we'll update uh, midpoint. So midpoint gets updated as well. So midpoint's going to be updated by taking the new low, which is 4, adding it to 7, which would be 11, and dividing that by 2, which would be 5.5. So we would now have midpoint uh, setting at 5. Again, we uh, chop off the fractional part, so we truncate that. So we'd have midpoint here at 5. And what we effectively have done after all that is eliminated half of our search space. So all of this business here is no longer in our search space because we have a new low and a new high. So the algorithm starts all over again. So we say that we do the comparison between what we have at midpoint, which would be 67 and 82. And we see that 82 is in fact greater than 67. So we're going to be updating low once again. So we'll have low being updated to being one more than the midpoint. So I'll indicate that low is being in, uh, updated here to being one more than the midpoint. And then we would calculate the new midpoint. So midpoint would just be calculated by adding low and high, which is uh, 13 in this case, and then dividing by 2. And that would be 6.5. We lop off or truncate the fractional part, so that would be 6. So we now have midpoint being 6, which is in this case the same as low. And that's perfectly okay for this algorithm. So midpoint is now here. And then we would do a comparison between the midpoint value, which is 82, and the search value, which is 82. And they're equal, so we're able to stop our search uh, at that point in time. But you can see that uh, you know, we eliminated half of our um, search space once again. So this is really powerful in terms of the way that binary search works. And let's remember, uh, just to kind of emphasize some of the main points, is that we do have this precondition that the array must be sorted. And the other thing is, is it cuts the search space in half after every single comparison, which is huge. Now more formally, we would probably say that the uh, performance of binary search, if we were looking at you know, de describing a function in terms of the amount of work required, the, the amount of comparisons, we'd say it has this log base 2 n performance, where n would be the uh, number of elements that we have in our array. So in this case, uh, we only had eight elements in our array, but you could think of something really large, so maybe uh, the 64,000 element array. So with a 64,000 element array, if you were doing log base 2 of 64,000, that would be around 16. 
And if you were to do a log base two of, of double that, say 128,000, that'd only be 17 something. I don't know exactly what it'd be, but it's around 17. So you'd only have to do really one more comparison if you double the search space. And that's really what's going on with binary search. We're able to double our search space and only have to do one more comparison to determine if the thing that we're looking for, or to find the thing that we're looking for, or to determine that the thing that we're looking for is not in the array. So let's go over to Eclipse now and code up our own version of binary search. All right, so I'm over in Eclipse now, and I've already created a project, and also I've created a CPP file called binary search. And what I've done is copied the body of our main function from linear search. So in one of my previous videos, we did a linear search algorithm, and I've just copied the body of the, the main function from that particular program into the main function here. And the only thing that I'm going to change up in this particular main function is our array. I'm going to make this array uh, a sorted array. So we'll just use the same numbers that we used in the example uh, that we did previously. So we'll say we have 12 and 22, let's see, 34, uh, 47, 55, uh, 67. Let's see, what else do we have? Oops, I forgot a comma. Let's see, comma. And then we had 67 and then 82 and then also 98. And the other thing we'll change is just the number of elements in our array. So whenever we call binary search, so I can guess, I guess I should change this here to uh, binary search, since that'll be the name of our function. And we'll change this here to eight, since we have eight elements in our array now. And the rest of this particular body of our main function from linear search that I've pasted over here into our binary search main function body will stay the same. So if you have any questions about how we developed uh, the code associated with this main function. Go and look at the linear search algorithm video and explain in detail sort of what we did here and you probably read through it and not have too much of a problem. Also, I should note that you can find a copy of this code from this video out on Pastebin. So if you look at the description, I'll have a link there to the URL on Pastebin where you can find this code. Okay, so let's go above the main function here and start writing the function definition for binary search. So this is going to be an int returning function, just like our linear search was an int returning function. So we're going to just return the int value that represents the index of where we found a particular search value. If we don't find it, we'll just return negative 1. So we'll have int as our return type, and the name of this particular function will just be binary search. And we'll pass in our formal parameters of an int array. And we'll pass in the size. So we'll say that that's int size, and we'll also pass in the search value. So the exact same formal parameters that we had for our linear search function. So if you remember from our discussion, we said that we needed to have a low and high value. So those were initialized, the low value was initialized to zero, and the high value is going to just be initialized to the last element, or the index of the last element of the array, which will just be size minus one. So we'll have an int variable here called low that we'll set to zero, and another int variable uh, called high that we will set to size minus one. So that's our low and our high. Now, the next part here, uh, I'm going to focus on really what we would do on a single iteration. So we continue doing the same operations over and over again. So I just want to focus in on what we're going to be doing on each iteration. We talked about being able to calculate this, uh, this midpoint. So I'm going to declare a variable called mid here. And then below that, I'm going to calculate what mid is. So we'll say that mid is going to be equal to, we said that that was just simply low plus high, right? And then we divided that by two. Now the cool thing is we're going to be doing integer division here. So low and high are both integers. Uh, two here is the int literal, so we have an int divided by int. So we end up with integer division and we're automatically uh, lopping off, truncating that fractional part, which is exactly what we want to have in order to calculate the midpoint index value. So we get that, and then once we calculate the midpoint index value, we can start doing our comparison between our search value and the value that, that's there at the midpoint. So we can ask this question. We can say if the search value, so if our search value is equal to the value that we have at array mid, so basically what we're saying there is we're just checking what the value is there at the, at the midpoint that we calculated, if that turns out to be the case, our search is over with, and we can just return mid at that point. Now, if that's not the case, we know that we either need to update uh, low or high. So we'll have an else if here and say, well, if the search value, 
the search value turns out to be greater than uh, array mid, so the, the value that we have there at the midpoint, then what we'll need to do is update low. So in that case, we'll update low to just being mid plus one. And that was the, the case that we saw whenever we were searching for the value of, I think it was 82. So we were searching for 82 and we kept having an update uh, low in that case. If that turns out not to be the case, we can just say else, because there's really nothing else to test, we'll update high. And high is just going to be updated to being mid minus one. And that's pretty much it in terms of what we're going to be doing on each iteration. Now we got to think about uh, the looping structure that we're going to have here. So we got to wrap up all this code that we just wrote here related to calculating the midpoint and then doing comparisons between the value at the midpoint and our search value to determine whether we found our value or if we need to update low or if we need to update high. So really this, this uh, set of steps here keeps going on as long as the low value is less than or equal to the high value. As soon as the high value crosses over the low value or the low value crosses over the high value, we need to stop at that point because we now have exhausted the search space of our array. So what we're going to do here is just have a while loop here. So while that condition there is where we have low, less than, or equal to high, then we want to keep doing this uh, operations or these set of operations here where we're updating the midpoint and then the, uh, the value that we're looking for is not equal to the value there at the midpoint, either updating high or low. So let me just tab all that code over and put in a close brace there. And that's pretty much it in terms of our binary search, except for if it turns out that we don't find the thing that we're looking for, we still need to return a particular value. And so we'll return, let me uh, create some spaces there so you guys can see that a little bit better. So we'll return negative one. So that's it for binary search. So not too bad of a function in terms of the number of lines of code and even the, the complexity of the, of the algorithm is not that bad. So let's go ahead and build this and run it. So we'll go ahead and build it. Looks like it looks like everything built okay and now we'll run it just to test everything out here. So we'll go ahead and uh, enter in an integer. We'll enter in uh, 82 just to see uh, a value that's actually in the array. And we see that the number 82 was found at the element with index value of 6. And let's check that out. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, so that's where 82 was found. Let's run it uh, a couple more times. And we'll put in maybe the value of 22. And we can see that uh, 22 was found at the element with index value of 1. And that is the case because this would be 0 and this would be 1. Uh, let's put in a value that doesn't exist in our array, so we'll put in maybe the value of, uh, let's see, 26, and we can see that 26 was not found. The other thing that I'd encourage you to do is, you know, something I really want people to, I guess, embrace is this idea of using the debugger. So you may want to step through the code and see exactly what paths of execution is being taken in the binary search function as you put in different values. Uh, so that's it for this video. In this video, we're going to take a look at informally analyzing the binary search and the linear search algorithms. And the reason why I say we're going to do an informal analysis is because algorithm analysis is this whole area of computer science that deals with determining the amount of time or the amount of memory, the amount of storage required to execute uh, some particular algorithm. And associated with that is a lot of formalism. And I don't want to really get into the formalisms in this particular video. But I will say that th there's two main methods for going about doing algorithm analysis. Uh, one is an empirical way, so we could go about uh, timing how long it takes us to execute a particular algorithm on a particular computer system. Or we could maybe count up the number of operations, so the number of comparisons, the number of additions, the number of uh, multiplication operations, so each one of those would have a cost associated with it. But with empirical analysis, we do have this drawback that is dependent upon the, the speed of a particular machine. So if we were to run the same algorithm on a different machine that was you know, twice as fast or had twice as much memory, we may get very different results. And the same thing goes with the programming language we use. So if we were to move from one programming language to another programming language, then the number of operations, you know, the number of additions, the number of comparisons, the number of multiplication operations may be very different. Uh, so that's really the drawback there with the empirical analysis. You really want to be comparing apples to apples and not have uh, some sort of um, dependency there, depending on what computer system or what programming language you're using. 
So with the analytical method, you really don't have those drawbacks. And, and with the analytical approach, we're looking at maybe uh, picking out a particular operation that maybe dominates the algorithm and finding out how many times that particular operation is executed. Uh, and we really don't even need to know the, the count precisely of how many times a dominant operation execute, executes. We can just express it as a function of the input size. So take, for instance, the linear search. We know in, the, in that case, the comparison is really the dominant operation that's going on. And it may be the case that we have to compare every single element in that array before we find the thing that we're looking for. So we can see in that case that it does change depending on how many elements we have to search through. So if we only had 10 elements, we only had to do 10 potential comparisons. If we had 100 elements, we'd have to do 100 comparisons. So the number of comparisons there is growing linearly, as the name indicates, uh, with the number of elements. Whereas binary search was very different. We were able to cut our search space in half, and we said that this cutting in half uh, function was the, the logarithmic function. So we said that it grows uh, logarithmically. So if we think about having a 100 element array and using binary search, we're able to cut our search space in half on that very first comparison. So to go from 100 elements to 50 elements to 25 to 12 and so on down the line. Of course, we should say that you know with binary search, we have to have a sorted array, whereas with linear search, we don't have to have a uh, sorted array. So what I want to do now is go over to Eclipse and do a basic comparison between our linear search algorithm and our binary search algorithm, just so we can get a feel for really the, the difference in the amount of work that's going on uh, between these two algorithms. So let's go over there and do that. Okay, so I'm over in Eclipse now, and I've already created a project, and I've also created a CPP file called Linear versus Binary. And I've pasted in our linear search uh, function and also our binary search function and made a few changes. So the, the changes that I've made is, is basically related to uh, keeping track of the number of comparisons that are going on. So I have this count variable here initialized to zero. And inside this for loop here, I just simply increment that count variable each time we do a comparison. And if it turns out that the value that we're searching for is equal to a particular array elements value, then we'll break out of our for loop and simply uh, output to the user the number of comparisons that took place. Now, it could be the case that we never actually enter into this if statement here and break out of the for loop. So I don't know if I've used the, the break statement before in previous videos, but that's just the keyword in, in C++ that allows us to break out of some structure based off of some condition. So it's what it's saying here is we're going to break out of this looping structure based off of this if statement being true. So it may be the case that we exhaust this entire for loop before we output uh, the number of comparisons. But that's still you know, information that we would like to know, because we are wanting to keep track of that, because the, the number of comparisons really is the, the overriding operation that's going on there with linear search. Now with binary search, we have something similar going on. We still have this variable called count. And then we have this looping structure again. Of course, with the binary search, we have a lot more going on inside the looping structure. Uh, so some of you may be saying, well, you know, you're only incrementing here the, the count associated with this comparison operation, but you really have, you know, this update of mid, so we have to, you know, do an addition and then a division operation. So there is, you know, additional work associated with binary search on each iteration. But again, the, the main thing that's going on is we have to iterate through this code some number of times. Again, the, the amount of work is some constant amount more on each iteration uh, more than the linear search, but again, it's this very small constant amount, so it's really quite minuscule in comparison to the overall number of iterations that we have to do uh, for linear search in comparison to binary search. But it's the same idea. As soon as we uh, find our search value, our search value is equal to a particular array element's value, then we'll break out of this looping structure and output uh, the number of comparisons uh, that took place. The other functions that we have, or the other function besides the main function, is this populate array function. And that just simply populates our array with some values. It just populates the array with the values of 1 up to our size. So a very simple function there. And then down here in main, we have a do while loop in which we simply ask the user to enter in an int for the size of the array. We create an array, and then we ask the user to enter in an integer value between 1 and the size to search for in the array. And then we call our populate array. Then we call linear search, then we call binary search, and then we ask the user uh, if they would like to run this again. Uh, the only other thing that's kind of new here is the sync function. So the sync function uh, basically just uh, clears out our buffer. So if there's any unread characters uh, that we have in our buffer, it clears that out before we call this get function, which the get function would just simply get a character uh, from the console there. 
So that's what's going on there in the main function. So let's go ahead and uh, compile or build this. So we're compiling and linking this program. Everything should compile and leak fine. And now we'll run it. And so we'll uh, start here fairly small. So it asks for us to enter in a size. So I'll say we have a 100 element array and we'll search for maybe the value of 95. So you can see here with the linear search, we had 95 comparisons. In comparison to binary search, we only had six comparisons. And you can see that this uh, disparity between the number of comparisons is going to grow as we increase the, the size of our array. So let's go ahead and uh, run this again. So we'll say, we'll say type in Y here and run it again. And we'll say that we'll do maybe a 5,000 element array and we'll search for maybe 4,785. So again, the linear search, as we expect, growing linearly, whereas with binary search, we discuss how it has logarithmic growth. So we're cutting that search space in half and we only did eight comparisons for binary search before we found the value that we were looking for. Uh, let me run it again. So we'll do Y here to run again, and this time we'll do maybe 100,000 element array, and this time we'll search for, I don't know, uh, 97,845. And you can see there that we went uh, from our previous time when we were doing 5,000 elements, we only did eight comparisons for binary search. This time we went up to 100,000. So, you know, a pretty big change there, and we only had to do 16 comparisons. Linear search, 97,845. So you can see the, the difference there. And let me just show you that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, quit this particular program and go back and, and change up our code. So even if we were to go in here and change up our count here, so instead of doing count plus plus, maybe we do count uh, plus equal three, we'll say that it's uh, three times as, as costly for binary search in comparison to linear search. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna change this up too. So we'll say, uh, Linear search, we'll say linear search cost, and we'll say uh, binary search uh, cost, for lack of a better term, because it's really no longer just counting the number of comparisons. We're just trying to illustrate that maybe on each iteration is three times more expensive for binary search as it is for linear search. And I don't even know if that's the case, but just to show you that um, that, that really isn't a huge factor, I'm going to go ahead and build this and, and run it again. So you'll see that that is a bigger factor with maybe some of our smaller values. So if we had only a 100 element array and we were searching for the value of 95, we can see, oh yeah, with linear search, still 95 comparisons, binary search, we had to do our 95 is the cost, uh, which in that case would be 95 comparisons. Whereas binary search, uh, we have a cost of 18, so that would be the number of comparisons plus, you know, calculating the midpoint and maybe doing uh, some other additional comparisons as well. But if you run this again, so let me do a Y here and run it uh, and do maybe 100,000. So we'll do 100,000 here and then do a search for, I don't know, 94,623. And you can see that we, we have very slow growth, even though we're doing three times the cost amount on each iteration for, for binary search. So you can see the big difference there. The other thing that we should state again is that with binary search, we do have to have a sorted array in comparison to linear search. It doesn't require us to have a sorted array. And there is a cost associated with sorting something. So, you know, whether you should use linear search or binary search, it really depends. You know, it depends on how many times are you going to be performing the search. If it's only one time and maybe the array is not that large, then linear search may make sense. If you're going to be doing a lot of times, then it may make sense to go ahead and sort the array and incur that cost so that you're not having to uh, search through every potential element of the array to find the thing in comparison to the binary search where you're actually cutting the search space in half. The, the last thing that I wanted to show you guys before I end this video is just a, a plot comparing uh, linear search to binary search. So if we look at this plot here, you can see that we have our linear search here in this orange and we have binary search here in the blue. And I only did it for, um, you know, a very small number of elements here. So this starts out with uh, two here and goes all the way to 32. So I was doubling the number of elements for the plots here. So it goes two, four, eight, 16, and then 32. So you can see here in blue uh, with, with binary search, even though we're doubling our search space, so doubling the number of elements, we only have to do one more comparison. So here we only had to do uh, one comparison here if we only had two elements, whereas if we went from two elements to four elements, we only had to do uh, 
two comparisons in that particular case. So we went from one comparison uh, to two comparisons. So here on the, the y-axis here, we have the number of comparisons. But you can see here with linear search, we went from uh, two to four. We had to go from two comparisons uh, to four comparisons there. So you can see that every single time that we're doubling, we're also doubling the uh, number of comparisons that are going on. That is not the case with... Uh, with linear, excuse me, with binary search, we have this very slow logarithmic growth, and you would even see more of a drastic comparison there if I selected larger values. Of course, it would start uh, looking like the uh, logarithmic growth was almost flat in comparison to the, the linear growth. All right, so that's it for this video. Hopefully, you have a better sense of, of what's going on in terms of the amount of work with uh, binary search and linear search. So that's it for this video.